Arendt, who will now take over the program, and she's the expert on the Wachusett Dam and Reservoir. Kathy. Thank you all so much. I'm just so honored to be here. Um, sorry the Rangers couldn't make it, um, but I'm happy to step in their place. If you do see the Rangers out at the reservoir, please stop and say hi. <laughs> they, they would enjoy that. We, we like to be good neighbors. I'm so thrilled that this room is full of people who are interested in the Wachusett Reservoir. So the first thing I want to say today is Happy World Water Day. So every World Water Day. Oh, okay. So every March 22nd is just a day put aside to appreciate uh, the precious precious resource we have um, that some people aren't so lucky to have. Um, the, uh, we have all the. Did you know where your water comes from? Yes. Where? Kuabe. Oh. <laughs> we get no love. It, <laughs> it does come from Kuabe, the water that you drink here in Clinton, but it's got to go to Wachusett Reservoir before it gets to you. So it's, it's the same. And so I will explain that a little bit to you. So, happy World Water Day. Let's really appreciate water and think, um, is water worth it? We're gonna look at some pictures here uh, of what, how immense in, uh, this construction feat was to create the Wachusett Reservoir. And really, was it worth it? And I think we'll find out, yes, it was. So, um, here we have the Wachusett Reservoir. It's drinking water for the town of Clinton, plus three, um, more than three million people. 108 square miles, 37 miles of shoreline. There is Cost Grove intake where the water leads. But let's talk about Boston. So we can't really talk about the why of Wachusett Reservoir. Um, until we talk about big picture, like why is it here? So the city of Boston first settled in 1630. Um, the first spring was from William Blackstone, which is like a little fun fact for me because before I started working here at Water Supply, I worked along the Blackstone River for um, oof, 13 years. So I love the story of William Blackstone um, and how he had to just leave Boston and get away from it all and settle along the Blackstone River. So anyway, let's circle back to his spring. Um, and then as the population in Boston grew, that's what they had. They had springs or wells or cisterns that were filled with rainwater. Well, they didn't really have any um, sewer systems at the time, so there was really a lot of issues with clean water. <coughs> some pollution going on, so they had to find something better. And that's when the trend of finding water and up, upland sources of water that could be gravity fed down for the population. So uh, here's uh, Jamaica Pond. Boston's population grew to just below 20,000. Jamaica Pond was tapped to bring water. But the problem with that is it didn't get up on top of Beacon Hill. Um, it didn't uh, go to the north end. Only wealthy people were able to get this water. So there's always this water question. Where is the water coming from? Is water worth it? Is it a right for people to have clean drinking water? And there were some problems back in the day. <laughs> Look at these wood pipes. Um, you can see the, that is like a connector. It's a wooden pipe connector, and that's what they had to rely on to bring water from the Jamaica Pond aqueduct. So um, not only not reliable and uh, not, it's a lot of waste using wood pipes. So after decades of the water question, where are we going to get water? Does everybody deserve water? Um, they came out west to Lake Kachishwit, which was first called Long Pond. 
Um, that was a series of reservoirs. So you can see the red line. This slide is taken from MWRA, Manages the Water, Massachusetts Water Resources Authority. You can see the red line and the aqueduct that's bringing the water to Boston, finally. So this um, Lake Chichuit was the first public water supply to Boston. And it was a big deal, a really big deal. It was such a big deal that there was a celebration. Kids didn't have school. There was a parade. The, <laughs> the mayor came. They, they had songs, dancing. <laughs> That um, frog pond fountain uh, spurt uh, 80 feet in the air. You can kind of think maybe it's like a Patriots Day parade today. It was a huge deal. Um, let's see. I have a quote here. Let's see if I can find it. I always love to get first person um, records. And I'm sure all of you here at the Historical Society can appreciate that. Um, but here is a quote from Mary White that lived in Boylston. Uh, her and her family made the two-day journey to see this great parade for the first public water supply. So she was an abolitionist. She uh, was fighting against slavery. She uh, was really forward-thinking. She was thinking about social um, benefits and uh, want equality for women. She was really forward thinking in her day. So here's a quote from her. She uh, rode an omnibus, went to celebrate the bringing of water from Kachichuit to the benefit of Boston inhabitants. A procession was formed near Park Street Church, which took two hours, and a two and a quarter hours to pass a given point without including the school children, which amounted to thousands. She traveled by omnibus, was like a stage, like a wagon pulled by a horse, uh, stagecoach kind of thing. She traveled from Boylston to Boston to see that. It was so important to her. Um, the creation of the Wachusett Reservoir here in Boylston wasn't during her lifetime, so we don't have an idea how she felt about that. Okay, so Kachichuit um, was not enough. So the population keep, keeps going. Uh, the demand is still going. 1872, there's the Great Fire in Boston. Devastating. Uh, the firefighters were hindered. The pipes were undersized. Uh, they didn't have the pressure that they needed to put out the fire. The fire lasted uh, two days, I believe. So it was devastating. So now, yes, something needs to be done. So from that, a system of seven res reservoirs along the Sudbury River were created. So you might know these today as s near state parks, like the Kachichuit. So we have Foss, Brackett, and Stearns, Ashland, Hockington, Whitehall, and Sudbury. So I tried to find the best pictures for you because I know you all are seeing some great historical photos. But here's uh, making Sudbury Reservoir here. And this machine is dredging out the um, sediment, trying to get some nice clean water going to Boston. And here is the plan. You can kind of see how everything just moved west. Uh, We've got the 10 mile circle of Boston there, and then Sudbury in the middle, and now we're talking about going to Wachusett because it's still not enough. So in 1895, the Metropolitan Water Board was formed, and that's their mission, to find a new source for Boston's water. So there were three proposed sites, Lake Winnipesaukee, it's New Hampshire, that's over the state line, it's too much trouble. The Merrimack River was already polluted, so no, no thanks. The Nashua River, beautiful, pristine, it's running through a valley. You can, you can dam the river, have some nice pristine water. So 
the Nashua River was chosen. This, this is uh, from Frederick Stearns, which is the chief engineer. And he goes on to say that with the least delay and the least cost, because that's what matters, right? Time and money. Uh, a very large quantity of pure water. It's capable of being supplemented from time to time from other sources which will furnish a, furnish a practically unlimited supply of pure water at small cost. So that part where he says um, from time to time might be supplemented from other sources, who knows what he's talking about there. Mm. <laughs> yes, so in 1895, it was in the back of the chief uh, engineer's mind that Quabbin was a possibility already, and it's, and it's in this note from the Board of Health in 1895, is that uh, inexpensive conduit can be constructed through the valley of the Ware River, beyond the Ware River, to the Swift, and even Deerfield, West and Westfield, if needed. And their goal was to have the best water than any found in the world. Pretty cool, right? Right here in Clinton. Uh, the water here is unfiltered. It's so clean and so well protected that the DEP gives a waiver every year to have the water does not have to be filtered. It's treated for bacteria and, uh, with ozone, um, but it doesn't have to be filtered because it's so well protected by the watershed and the protections that we have here. You know, if you go for a walk, it says no dogs, no bikes, no, <laughs> no ice skating, right? Well, there's a reason for that. You can see the green area around the reservoir is all protected land. So how the land is used uh, is directly relates to how clean the water is. So we do, um, we do work for the Division of Water Supply Protection, so that's our whole goal, is to protect this water so it can remain unfiltered and one of the few unfiltered sources in the country. So, how was this done? Flooded sections of Boylston, West Boylston, Sterling, and Clinton, but only parts of the town. Still, it was pretty devastating to the people that had to uh, leave. So here is uh, looking the valley in 1896, right a uh, year after the, the uh, Clean Water, um, not the Clean Water Act, but the Acts of 1895. This is going out by Gate 22, where the Mass Wildlife offices are on Temple Street, 140 in Boston. If you walk out there today, there's this rocky ledge that's to the left of the cliff, and that is where this surveyor is sitting with his notebook. And so in 1904, this isn't even full yet. So it didn't fill until 1908, so it's getting there. Same, same view. Uh, that's the river going through the valley, and now it's flooding. Uh, view today, so this isn't up on the ledge, this is down by the shore, but it's the same view. And I'll take you through a few photos here. This is a photo on dam day. So this is from standing in the middle of the dam. And we've got that little island out there. Now, <laughs> you all know this story, right? <laughs> you used to try to swim out there. You used to try to swim out there. Oh, so I understand. Like, this is my favorite story. And uh, I didn't bring the piece of rock from that island, but it's just fun to touch it and say, oh, I've been out there. I never tried to swim out there, though. Um, so there's the pavilion, Cunningham's Pavilion. I understand it was uh, a place, the place to go, dancing, right? <laughs> was the town a dry town at the time, the no, no alcohol? Oh, OK. I don't think it was ever dry. OK. <laughs> it was Boylston then, right? Boylston was the one that Mary White was from. Because I used to go to Anyway, how cool is that? Dancing at this pavilion over uh, looking the river. Beautiful. Look at that place. How do we feel we have a boat that would take you with Oh, there was a the Isabella. Is that the boat? On that tree, so these photos, I, 
I am so thrilled to know that there are some actual volunteers in this room that worked at the, on the glass plate negatives with our archivist, uh, Sean Fisher. These are online at digitalcommonwealths.org. They're such good quality, you can enlarge them and see the details. So that flyer or poster on that tree is a, a commercial for cigars. <laughs> so not only photos, but we have the survey maps. So if you want to figure out where a certain location is, you can pull up these survey maps and all the landowners are marked out there. And there's a nice little trick that you can do. I mean, this is so cool. You see the original river. You can line it up to the, the depth map of the reservoir today and see that's where the deepest part of the water is through that original channel. And then you've got the railroad that was, uh, just had to be moved. It's going right through where the reservoir was going. But the neat little trick you can do is you can enlarge it and find these cool numbers with arrows. Now these numbers are the numbers of the photographs and the arrows are the, the angle that they were taking. So you can type in these little numbers and you can figure out, oh, 2573. That's Cunningham's Pavilion. How cool. So this is 1899. The trees are gone. We're, we're getting work done quick, quick. So this is a year before, it's nestled in the woods there, beautiful. And then here is 1899, again, trees are gone. We've got the trestle there for the um, railroad, or it's either a temporary road for the horses and the carts to bring out the dirt. We'll see that in a second. Inside the pavilion, how cool is that? <laughs> right? And if you enlarge it, you can see the little score marks on the wall, the little scratches on the wall. Uh, it's super cool. All right, so here we go to the next one. This is a first-hand account from Persis Andrews. So we found her house by um, looking up her name, but you could also do it by going to the land survey, finding her name, and finding the red number for the photo. So she had a 30-acre parcel. Their land and buildings were settled for $3,750 for her 30 acres in those buildings. They were inherited to her. They were her grandfather's, so she just uh, was in her grandfather's house, lived there all her life. This is how she felt. It seems hard for me. I don't like to think about it, but I suppose I'll have to do the same as the rest. When I go down to the cellar and see the big stones on the wall, which father rolled into place with his own hands, it makes me feel sad to think that the house will be destroyed. Of course, right? But what can she do? It was the first time the state took land for a public water supply from people who were already living there. So, yeah, like she said, it's hard for her, but she can't think about it. She has to do it. So this is along uh, South Station. Short quote. Okay, next thing they needed to do. All right, beautiful valley, pristine river. We gotta put a dam here and uh, flood, the, flood the valley. So it's perfect. There's a nice little wedge there to put a dam in. So there's the site. First thing they did, uh, boring machines. They um, went down checking how solid the earth was for the dam site. And they did that all over the reservoir, too. And they did experiments by <coughs> mixing it with water and figuring out. And they had a precise uh, amount of how much they had to dig down the dirt of the floor of the reservoirs so that organic matter wouldn't um, decompose, make the water muddy and gross. So it's just becoming of uh, like germ theory and thinking about water and algae and all that stuff. But this specifically was for how strong the the ground was to support a dam. So they found a nice site here. Uh, 
you can't build a dam if the river's flowing through, so they had to divert the river. They had to divert the river so they could have some dry land to build the dam, but also they had to keep the water going down to the mills. So, uh, so much water had to keep going. But they also had to get water to Boston, because what if there was another fire and they didn't have enough water? So uh, this was all in a hurry. There were several projects going on at the same time. <coughs> We've got the uh, temporary dam there and that wooden structure that looks to me like a long barn, but it's a flue. It's to set the water, divert the water going away. So here's another view of it. You can see the water going through. Uh, Oh, here. This thing. Keep your eye on that thing. That's where the aqueduct is going to be. Alright, so this is the other end of the flue. This is where the water is coming out. Rock cut under the main flume. Did you ever think about that? The, the dam that you see in you see the grass at the dam, you walk up to the dam, and you're like, that's huge. But it's down below ground, it's the same amount as it is high. And so this is, they're cutting into the rock. Here, it's underneath the flume. The pipes, the upper gate chamber here. So uh, as soon as uh, it can, the water is going to go through those bottom pipes. There again is the flute, but now the water is like up here. Last picture was down here. All right. Plus, plus the railroad trestle. Oh, yes. Yes, that's why I stuck. Thank you. You can see, yeah, several projects are going on at the same time. Check out that railroad trestle. They're not waiting. They're putting that up at the same time. Okay. Alright, so also at the same time, there's got to be a, the aqueduct, we've got to get the water to Boston. So Sudbury is already there, so they're making an aqueduct that goes right to the Sudbury Reservoir. So this is interesting. Um, this is, they're, they're cutting it right through the rock. Very dangerous. Who would like to do this? Um, this is, this was the most accidents, the most fatalities, doing this kind of work, just blasting through. Horrible. Look at that. <laughs> but the, the aqueduct was like that big. So here we go. Lining it, starting to line it with brick. Did you know water runs through that? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't until I started working here. Blew my mind. So the aqueduct runs right through there. I'm so glad you all know. But look at the amount of work that goes through that. Um, they're here plastering it. Um, that's what's inside that bridge when you drive over. Interesting. No labor laws yet. Um, this was the first child actually there's no, there's two children here uh, that I came across in photos but now I'm seeing them all the time so it's like that right Once Forced you, labor. yeah so I guess uh, the lighter work they did or uh, a lot of times it's in the aqueducts this child has no shoes so please don't drop a brick on my foot but yeah uh, before labor laws, you'll see all these pictures, there just wouldn't be something that you could do today. <coughs> so the aqueduct connected to the Sudbury system, which would then relay the water to the district, to the new Western Aqueduct and the old Sudbury Aqueduct. All by gravity. Here we are. Look at the difference between the, <laughs> the guys in the aqueduct and these guys. So this is, yay, the aqueduct is finished. And this is a huge event. This is where the water is, um, who are they poking it with? But this is where the water is leaving. 
it's on its way to Marlboro. And then we have the, the terminal chamber here. Again, a big contrast with the people who pose for the, kind of like today, a big contrast with people who pose for the photo once the project's done and the people doing the job. So here we are. But uh, a huge event, wonderful. Uh, the water is coming through. Now those people can get pure, clean water. But the project is just really starting. So that was the first thing to do. And everything else needs to be done. The land needs to repair, be prepared. Um, in some areas, they were actually plowing it. But they had to clear everything off and then dig down and take up the top soil because that's the stuff that they experimented with and made water really gross. And organic matter decomposing is not something you want in your drinking water. So, anything here look familiar? I know you see it. Stone Church. <laughs> Stone Church. Yeah, it's our famous landmark. Um, but here is what was next to the Stone Church, and that is not there today. Even though it wouldn't have been underwater, it would have been on the edge of the water, but it's made of wood. So, we don't want anything um, nearby that can contaminate the water that's going to um, deteriorate over time. So we've got the uh, Catholic Church there, that other building that is now like the Odd Fellows home. But this is very recognizable, the Old Stone Church. And here's another view from the back side. They're stripping soil here, 1904. Time is moving on. We still got to we still got to get all these uh, burn piles going. They're loading the soil up onto these carts and um, probably bringing it uh, to build new roads or bringing it over to the North Dyke. Did you know how deep this was? You probably did because a lot of you saw this photo before, right? <laughs> this blows my mind it, when you are on uh, the causeway on Route 12 and you're going over this bridge and you see the stone church. Mm -hmm. I never thought about how deep that water there is. No wonder the people are always trying to fish there off their bridge. That's really deep, cold water there. And there's a close-up view uh, through that bridge. And there's the remnants of the Catholic church. So the old stone church was going to go as well. But they had just rebuilt it. It had burnt down because it was wood. And they rebuilt it of stone, which was a wonderful idea. They couldn't have known what was going to happen. But because it was of stone, uh, the water board um, agreed to let it stay if everything was stripped out of it. So that's why you kind of go there. I don't know. If you can remember the first time you walked in there, was it a little disappointing? Like, there's nothing here. <laughs> it's stripped. Um, and that's why, because there's nothing in there that could decompose. So how deep was the water? How deep is that water there? I am, yeah, I would say at least 60, 70, you think? Yeah, it's pretty deep. So uh, this whole, what we call Thomas Basin, really does a, a good job at keep, keeping the water clean because today the water is coming from the Quinnipoxit River and the Stillwater River. And when those rivers are moving, they're, they're pulling in uh, sediment and they're picking up dirt from the bottom. But this is so deep, this whole Thomas Basin, that all of that has a chance to settle before it comes into the main reservoir. So all the dirt and stuff is settling in this deep area. And then when we get to the reservoir, We've got cleaner water. All right, so everything was removed, right? But there's a couple things that were left. This is the, this bridge was dismantled, I believe. This is a railroad, but this here is kind of just going to be buried, and it's part of that road. So when you drive over the causeway, you can know there's a, there's a bridge under there supporting it. And this little fact is from one of someone in the audience, Paul Maroney, <laughs> showed me this picture. So uh, we'll ha we have to have a conversation uh, with everybody once these slides get through. 
There's so much uh, information in this room. I can't wait. Okay, so there's another view of the old stone church. The, the um, Catholic church is gone. 1908. Have you ever seen the water that high? <laughs> I'll do it a little close up. Wow. 1908. So the reservoir is full. In 1908, it's full. It probably will not ever be this full again because the way that the spillway has been um, redone, it used to have, oh, here is my next slide. It used to have this, uh, so this spillway, please forgive the old photos for calling it a waste wear. <laughs> but when you're talking about drinking water and the water that's spilling out of the reservoir that we're not using anymore, they used to call it waste, you know. Uh, we would never call that today. It's all good water. Um, but this is extra water that's leaving the reservoir when, when we have high water. You used to have a cart that went along this and kind of pulled up flashboards. So the water could have been that high in 2008, but today we have a hydraulic system and flashboards that are uh, different, so it probably won't ever be that high with the system we have today. We like it at 390, 391 um, feet above sea level. Okay, so you all know this. Hundreds of homes, six mills, eight schoolhouses, two churches, four churches, two cemeteries, and 30 miles of roads and rail lines. Uh, the mills, really interesting when you're thinking from a perspective of uh, clean water and water pollution. The mills were removed um, and then considerable work was done around those mills before anything was flooded to make sure everything was cleaned up and the soil wasn't contaminated from any of the industry. Here's the good part. The cemeteries. <laughs> right? It's spooky. Everybody likes to talk about it. It's like, what? Why did they do that? You can't have bodies in drinking water. So this is Beeman Cemetery. Here's the one here in, in Clinton, that's a cemetery island. And you can see how they're chunking out the dirt down. Um, it's pretty deep. It's not, not quite six feet, but they're chunking it out very methodically, making sure everything is, is out of there. And see the nice gravel there. I know. Look at this. Look at the uh, modeling of the soil. Yeah. There. <laughs> yes. So um, that's from the the glacial lake Nashua that was here, right? All the deposits. It's pretty cool to see it. So yeah, this probably isn't a new story for you, but uh, it was done as respectfully as possible. Uh, I can't imagine having that job um, maybe better than blasting through a hillside. Um, but all everything was moved and then brought down South Meadow Road to the new cemetery. Okay, blasting through. This is relocating the railroad. Uh, it's beautiful to walk through that rock cut today. But I always, when I, if you've been on my walk on the North Dyke, you know I always kind of pause there. Like, uh, like this, this is the dangerous place. Like, let's just, uh, for a minute, um, and kind of pay respect to the people who did this work. Yeah, this little guy up on top, <laughs> blasting away. Nice, again? <coughs> okay, so, this, the railroad, the spillway that we all love. How many people jumped off the... <laughs> I don't want to hear it. <laughs> um, the spillway. The spillway today looks like a river. Totally man-made. Totally man-made. And so everything down there is beautiful. We're so lucky to have this in, in Clinton. Like, who doesn't want to go there and just enjoy the day? But it was done very deliberately because the engineers knew and the architects knew that it would be a place where people would want to go for recreation. 
And so they didn't just make a spillway, they made a beautiful uh, river waterfall that goes under this beautiful bridge. Okay, there it is. We still have the foundations in the water today. Some more. Uh, working on the, the railroads. Good. Train's going. Dam's not done yet. It's still, it's still going to build that. Um, all vegetation was removed. Oh, I thought this photo was pretty cool because we had the old stone church there and we have 400 cords of wood piled up um, in the valley. And so at this point, when this photo was taken, uh, they were allowed to continue church services for another month. Uh, so that would be weird, right? A church that you love that was just built a couple years ago and you gotta find a new building to worship in, but there's like all this wood piled up. All right, so 6.9, let's call it seven. Seven million cubic yards of soil. I think they've earned it. I can exaggerate and say seven. Where did it go? Where did it go? <laughs> it, it wasn't wasted, but it was uh, brought over to the north and south dikes. So to flood the whole reservoir, the water would have just spilled out in those two areas. So Route 110 and Route 70, those high hills there, have got all the soil from the valley floor. There it is. Putting it in carts. And then this little um, railroad track, temporary track, is bringing it to build up the dikes. How much soil do you need to hold back 65 billion, billion gallons of water? I can't imagine. And they fortified it with uh, bricks and riprap. Uh, new roads, so it's not only taking things apart, it's building new things, right? Relocating the railroad, building new roads. This is down by the Stillwater River. Oh, these beautiful arches, continuing with that theme, just make, let's just make everything beautiful. Uh, that's the Quinnipox arches over by the rail trail. There's the... Weren't those two pipes from Clark? Yeah, the... Uh, over by uh, Quinnipoxit River, that's where the Quabbin water meets our water, meets the river, yes. Okay, so building the dam, who knows this guy's name? John Mercer! John Mercer. <laughs> he, he had to have been someone important to have the honor of laying the first stone, and he also laid the last stone. Right? And so when I'm up there on dam day, so the dam's only open, you can walk across it twice a year. When I'm there Saturday, the Saturday before Mother's Day, I'll get this same question. Where is the first stone? I can't tell you. <laughs> you have pictures of it, but you can't see it today. <laughs> because we have you can see the last stone up on top of the dam, but you can't see the first one. It's way down, um, down below. So the dam goes 112 feet uh, underground. So they're down there. And there's a little cross section to help you uh, visualize. So that's the ground that you're standing on. This is every, everything underneath the ground. And right in the middle is where they, you know, they had to build it on bedrock to keep it secure. Ashley granite from Chelmsford. That's the pretty stuff on the outside. The inside, it's got some rubble. You can see the inside. More pictures, those huge cranes bring in boulders from side to side. Um, right? Some of these laborers, I hope they had you know, even a moment of joy when they pose for these pictures. Yeah. Uh, they deserved it. Oh, there's the flume, the wooden structure there that's bringing the water. 
Okay, here's the, okay, we got the water coming through. 1904, so the aqueduct's been done for a while. We've got the powerhouse coming along. Dam's not done, but the reservoir is not waiting. It's starting to flood. This aqueduct is going. This here is a wet spot. That's where the flume was. It's still a little wet, so we, they gotta work on that. And there's a close-up. So we got the fountain, we've got that, the, all this dirt here needs to fill in that. And they do. They're doing it. And there's the stairs. There's the stairs. There's still more. There's still more dirt up there. <laughs> so this is at the top. That's that pile of dirt. And they gotta spread that all out. So it, these pictures just give you an idea of the scale. Spillway. The spillway. Yup, they're working on that. Moving up. This this is going back. Girder for the visor. There. Okay. There he is again, famous John Mercer, standing on that last stone. And with, uh, I love the dog. Again, I just, I hope that they had a moment of happiness when they were posing for these photos. Some of the poses are just crazy. All right, so uh, little facts. It's 115 feet above ground, but below ground 112 feet. This was a nice field trip I had this summer. So happy to have high school kids interested. Uh, Lancaster Mills, this is a before photo. So we're, we're looking at this spot, this is the river, no dam. And then here we are after. It's fitting nicely into the landscape, I'm just thinking how intrusive it really was, but <coughs> there it is, okay. What, how are we doing for time? Do you guys want to talk about the workers? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You do? Mm -hmm. Alright. <laughs> if you went back one photo, it's the view from my house. Oh, nice. Up on the hill. Yeah. Is that well, stone that's the, wall? That's, that goes down to the priest grounds, but the end of Cedar Street is just before that. Oh. And it looks up to the church. Nice. Cedar and Church. Oh, that's Cedar. <clears throat> that's uh, yeah, Colonial Press right here, and that's the, the from the uh, armory that wall comes all the way up to my property. Uh, that's cool. How's everyone doing in your seats? Need to. Well, I had a question though. By the stone church, before yep. you go through that big arch, yep. was that still Nashua River in the basin, or was that still water? So it's the, all the rivers kind of converge there. We got still water, Quinnipoxit, yeah, the Thomas Basin, yeah. Because you could see it meandering through when you saw the church, the whole churches, and I said, is that still Nashua there? Or is it yeah, on the on the land survey maps, it's marked as Nashua River in that spot. Yep. Okay. So what's the difference here? We see this guy; he's not even dirty. <laughs> He's got to be the boss, right? So, again, this is before labor laws. Um, they had a system, the, pan, the patron system, or the patron system, or the boss system. So, mostly it was Irish immigrants, but the boss patron would go meet the immigrants as they arrived. Like, hey, I got a job. Uh, you'll get paid. You'll get food. You get a house. Um, but <clears throat> I'm going to loan you money to get there. So I'm going to pay your ticket for the train to get there. And then you're going to owe me. But that's OK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but kind of not OK, because the, the houses Oh, here's some, here's some facts first. So, pay scale per day, a dollar a day, from that old saying, a dollar a day. 
if you, if you had a horse, $1.25. But the skilled, the skilled masons um, got considerably more money. So no one else could do it. Um, so here's some engineers. Check these guys out. They got candles. They have candles on their aprons. <laughs> so they're going in the aqueduct. Tunnel work. Yeah, tunnel work. <clears throat> so they're dressed a little bit better, but who wants to do that? All right, so here, I got a house. This is the house that they have promised. It's a, a it, it's whatever. It, some of them were, some have grass um, roofs. Uh, these guys have a horse. It's, uh, I wish Ranger Will was here because he would tell you, this is a new guy, right? He's got a white shirt, he's smiling, uh, the others aren't amused, so we're thinking that's a new guy. <laughs> he, he hasn't seen where he's got to live yet. So <laughs> there it is, there's an encampment. This um, nicer building is the commissary. So this is where they had to get everything. So remember the guy who met them that said they had a job at a house and he loaned them money to get there on the train? Now the deal is though, anything he wants to buy, he has to buy from the company store. The clothes, the shoes, food, anything. And so they got paid once a month uh, at the beginning and by the end of the month, they didn't have any actual cash. So it's not, uh, it, it seemed good to someone arriving and needing work, but it, it didn't, it wasn't that great. Um, look at this guy. What is he doing? Uh, so these are the, they're getting a little bit more pay because they're, they're skilled masons. Um, this guy makes me laugh. I, I, I hope he had the best day that day. Um, what's going on? I just I love the sense of humor. I mean, come on. But also, oh, right? How miserable. But that tunnel is big enough for a horse and the whole team. They're, they're, you can't even see. There's, oh, they're in muck. <laughs> Here's the guys with uh, candles on their aprons. <laughs> There's, this might fall on them. They have jacks yeah, to hold up the, yeah. so yeah. Um, local people, like you, complain. They're like, wait a minute, these guys, uh, these workers aren't getting, it's not fair. They're not getting paid. They only get paid once a month. Um, also, we think you wasted money, which is why, <laughs> you know, the title of this is um, Report on the Joint Special Committee Appointed to Inquire into Alleged Violations of Labor Laws. And here's, the, here's what's important to people, people, liquor laws, <laughs> and extravagance and favoritism in expenditure of public monies. You spent too much of our money, right? And also, you didn't pay these workers fairly. So it actually was a start of changing the labor laws. So that was thanks to um, local people who had the ear of influential people. Do you know, do you know who was on that commission? Um, I can find out. Just curious, because I, um, I know David I. Walsh was a state rep around 1901, mm -hmm. and I know he was uh, very interested in, in the NWRA at the time. <coughs> Just curious. Oh, you? interesting. I don't know uh, off the top of my head, but you could look it up. Senate number 248. This is um, this is this is July 1900. <coughs> All right, just some before and after photos. So this is a question I started with: Is water worth it? Is it worth all that? <laughs> so, so we have enough water today. 
um, from the Quabbin Reservoir, uh, it doesn't have to keep going west. There's so much water, um, even through the drought, because of the management, watershed management practices, there's been enough water to supply the water users. So today we have over 3.1 million people using the water. So is that all called Coapan Aqueduct, or is it actually where is it going? So we'll start, start <coughs> like we'll start at Coapan. So we're here, Wachusett, little tiny compared to Coapan. So there's some redundancy here. We have the original uh, where we saw the pictures where they were lining with brick, the aqueduct. So that's there, but also there's the straight shot here that's uh, Cosgrove. So it goes to Marlboro to be treated at the John J. Carroll water treatment plant. So there's two, that's the one we use, the Carroll, uh, the Cosgrove. Tunnel. But if something went wrong, you can switch back. They can switch back, so that's amazing. So where does it go from there? Where does it go from there? Holtman uh, Aqueduct. Uh, through the Sudbury Reservoir, and then it just keeps going to... It goes to Ashland and Sudbury? Yeah, so wherever the water needs to go. Because it's not only 10 miles in Boston, it's 51 communities now. But what They're about uh, when the Ashland had all that, that pollution and they had that great big uh, cover-up of the, of the pollution? Um, and the river, the Sudbury River was running pink and blue from the dye cup. Yes. And that's our dripping water. Yeah, so Sudbury is offline. Sudbury is an emergency supply at this point. Oh, okay. um, But still, any any kind of pollution is not great for water because if there was an emergency, we would we would hook up to Sudbury. Isn't there almost three, three miles of uh, unopened or un... Uh, yeah, open channel. Like in South Brown, places like that, where yeah. the channel opens up. Yeah, there's three of that original um, aqueduct. There's so three miles open channel. But yeah, so Quabbin goes through this to Ware River and then comes out at kind of where the rail trail is. It's a hydroelectric facility out there in West Boylston. And it generates uh, River, River, Road. River Road. It generates electricity and it spills right into the Quinnipiac River on oh, the next next one here it is um, it spills right into the Quinnipiac River you can kind of see the different color of the cold cold water coming from Coabin and then goes to Thomas Basin um, settles out and then joins the main reservoir that's seasonal usually May to October that aqueduct is open and then 51 communities but you guys will open it if there's like a major hurricane or something coming up. Get out. Oh yeah. And lower. Yeah, they, yeah. They absolutely. Somebody said the spill is. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to shut that. It's okay. Okay. It's eight o'clock. How's everybody doing in their seats? <laughs> I heard they weren't comfortable. Time for beer. Do we want to have a conversation? Do, does anybody have any questions? Oh, thank you. Can I put the lights on? Sure, let's turn the lights on. Um, One lady just said, these are half an hour seats. They're half an hour seats. I mean, I could, I could keep talking, but I know I heard the seats are uncomfortable. Um, I do want to introduce in the back of the room, if he's listening, I do want to introduce in the back of the room Paul um, Maroney. So he has an amazing uh, website. He's doing some wonderful work, and I've learned a lot um, from Paul. So Yeah, where, where, where were the encampments? The encampments were close to 
where the work was being done. So they were kind of all over the place. In, in Berlin, by the quarry, they were. They also had some going along with towards Northboro, where the aqueduct was being built, and then here and there along the valley floor. Don't mind. The I know one of them was. Um, I think it's Pleasant Street in Berlin, where the school is, somewhere along there, um, in the embankment. That's what they told me at your, your program. South, uh, South Street. Is that what it's called? South California. It's above the railroad tracks, right? Like on the way to the mall. Yeah, I didn't get my street right. I know the spot. Uh, now all over the ground, there's houses there and everything else. No, nothing like that. Nothing left. I know. More questions here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and there was one for the black people up on Boyle's Road. Yeah. Yes, yeah. The encampments were, you know, they, they were almost told to stay in camp. Uh, not everybody liked them wandering the streets. And uh, they were, you know, a new cultural group to a lot of people. Um, and that was a, needless to say, a problem. But the uh, being more concerned about it. Why don't we, uh, if there's any, if, are there any other questions? And she, uh, Catherine is available afterwards if you wanted to come up and ask one. You said they, uh, they cut the stone from Jonesburg? How much did they cut locally at the quarry in Berlin, I think it is? Or maybe some of the that was for the river restaurant. Yeah. Oh, that was the river. Yeah. They would take it right there at Willow Road. In the back there was a quarry. And they would fill up a tram car or whatever they wanted to call it. And then there was a switchback railroad that came down the hill and bridge. And then they went along the bank and just dumped it out. And then we back and another one and dumped it. They kept moving the track as they were moving the car. In the winter time, even now, you can see like a almost like a rail line coming out on yeah. the corner of Willow Road and Route 70. You can kind of see it coming out from the quarry. And then it just stops. Uh, you know, they didn't need it. That is 10% of what we have on the Wachusa Dam and Reservoir. But we, we dug out some things, including like the original layout of the original St. John Cemetery uh, on Cemetery Island. It's right out there with the main table. We've we got plenty of others on the other side. So thank you very much. Enjoy some refreshments, and I hope to see you on Clinton Trivia on April 26th. Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you.